Okay, uh, it was a great delight to be here two weeks ago, uh, and uh, I hope it wasn't too overwhelming to you. There's a lot of content there. Uh, what I want to focus on today is the, uh, is the sediment record, and, uh, and uh, specifically the issue of how does one account for the, all the thousands of feet of, of fossil-bearing sediment ro sedimentary rocks we have all over the earth in terms of a, of a Genesis flood. Uh, and it appears that we're, it's even less than a year. The uh, scripture says that the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. So most of this geological work needs to unfold in that relatively brief period of time. How in the world can we get many thousands of feet of, of sediment transported and deposited in such a brief period of time? So that's the, that's the focus of our discussion today. Um, let's, just, let's just go back and, uh, and look at, again at the Genesis account, just some selected verses. We see in Genesis 6, uh, it, it says, Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. Then God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them, because of mankind. And behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. Behold, I, even I, I am bringing the flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life from under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall perish. Uh, and he, he uh, gives Noah instructions for building the ark. And then in the next chapter, verse 11, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on the same day, all the fountains of the great deep burst open and the floodgates of the sky were opened. The rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, next chapter, or in verse 19, the water prevailed more and more upon the earth so that all the high mountains everywhere under the heavens were covered. All flesh that moved on the earth perished. Birds, cattle, beasts, every swarming thing that swarms on the earth and all mankind. Of all that was on the dry land, all in whose nostrils was the breath of, sp of the spirit of life died. Thus he blotted out every living thing upon the face of the ground, face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things and to birds of the sky, and they were blotted out from the earth. And only Noah was left together with those that were with him in the ark. And the water prevailed on the earth 150 days. So this is uh, this account, brief as it is, uh, very clearly describes a, a world cataclysm that destroyed the earth, uh, resurfaced the entire face of the earth, and uh, destroyed all air-breathing, land-dwelling life, except that which was saved on the ark. According, according to this scriptural account. Last time we, we, uh, we talked about uh, the that, this, that this cataclysm involved large-scale tectonic change and the, the reasons for that. Uh, and it was something I came to realize in the spring of 1978 is that uh, it has to do with the age of the ocean floor. The, the, the igneous ocean floor through various, several different methods. And, and uh, Bernard actually said I should have elaborated more on those methods. Uh, first of all, there have been about two, th uh, these methods say that the, 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 the ocean floor is, is younger than a significant part of the continental fossil bearing sediment record. And how do we, how do we reach that conclusion? Well, first of all, there have been some 2,000 uh, cores taken through the deep sea drilling project and if the water depth is, is, is in some of the shallower parts of the ocean floor uh, fossils ha there's been a record of fossils preserved microfossils and and uh, it's only the most recent part of that microfossil record history that's preserved on the ocean floor nothing no paleozoic uh, microfossils are have been found anywhere on any ocean floor not, not only that, the, the dust particles that settle into the ocean, uh, many of these are, have magnetic minerals, and the, 
and the sediments that accumulate on the bottom of the ocean floor have a record of uh, the Earth's magnetic reversals through time. When the dust, when the particle, the, the, the particle settles down on the bottom, it, its orientation is, is controlled if it's magnetic by the direction of the Earth's magnetic field. So the, the sediment cores have this record of, of, the, um, of the magnetic reversals. Plus the igneous rocks themselves, when they cool, also contain that record. And uh, those, that record can be correlated by lava flows on continental volcanoes. And, uh, uh, and then one, one, it, one can dredge the ocean floor, bring back actual rock samples and, and date these. And I believe even though the uh, radioisotope dating is, uh, has a big problem, uh, which I alluded to last week, uh, in that, the, well, uh, it doesn't give an a, a correct absolute age. I believe the relative age that radioisotope dating provides, the relative ages are valid in general. So uh, again, the, those ages indicate that these rocks are significantly younger than uh, a major part of the uh, continental sediment record. So based on the age of the ocean crust relative to that of the continental fossil record, uh, the opening of the Atlantic Ocean must have occurred during the flood, and indeed all the present day ocean floor must have been produced at a mid ocean ridge since the onset of the flood. And the logic then is that the, the flood had, had to be, therefore, a significant tectonic cataclysm. Okay, so we, that was what we talked about last week. And uh, this slide marks, this arrow marks the, the point in the record. Uh, uh, and, and all the ocean floor today is, uh, was, was, was produced uh, after all this part of the sediment record was, uh, was already in place. Uh, and uh, last time I, I showed this animation uh, and how, how plates, the, the cold material can plunge down to the bottom of the mantle in a matter of, of a few weeks time that the, there's physics, good physics, based on experimental measurements that silicate minerals to form under stress. And uh, so I've spent many years working on modeling that process. So I, I showed this animation, computer uh, 3D model of, of flow in the inside of the earth. This is what uh, uh, unfolds at the surface and how the plates move apart. Uh, with, with, uh, with time, we, we saw that last week, just to refresh your memory. So, so we're, we're, uh, we're this, this has to do with the tectonic thing, uh, aspects of the flood. And, th and that process left a ring of, of cold material at the bottom of the mantle that, that modern, modern uh, earth science simply cannot account for. The temperature of this cold ring uh, is uh, not is very close to the temperature of rock at near the Earth's surface, the tectonic plates at the surface. And this red, red feature is hot material from near the core mantle boundary that was squeezed up when all this coal material settled down at the bottom. So this is, this is direct evidence of a recent episode of catastrophic plate tectonics. I mentioned several other evidences, uh, similar evidences last week. But what I want to focus on this week uh, has to do, as I've said, uh, about explaining the sediment record. An effective defense of the Genesis flood cries out for a reasonable explanation for the huge volumes of fossil-bearing sediment that blanket the continents today. Uh, in the uh, in continental platform regions, where it's called platform, such as the heartland of the U.S., the sequence of fossil-bearing sediment layers is commonly 10,000 feet or more in total thickness, in sedimentary basins and on continental shelves, the total can be many times larger than that. And the average over the in, uh, all the continent surface of the world is about 6,000 feet of sediment, or around 1,800 meters. So what conceivable hydrological process could have eroded, transported, and deposited such a staggering volume of sediment within just a few months' time? Uh, and just to, I showed this slide last week. Uh, at the end of this cataclysm, after all of this sediment had been deposited in a few weeks' time, then forces 
uh, uh, that are you know not operating today stripped away a large fraction of that sediment and took it out to the continental shelves. So we see here in the in the Colorado Plateau area evidence of a, a very thick deposition and a significant fraction after it was deposited eroded away uh, during the cataclysm, during the runoff time of the flood. All right, I don't think I, sh did I show this slide last time? I don't think I did about the mega sequences. Back in the 1960s, um, a geologist by the name of Lawrence Sloss published some work. He worked for an oil company and he published this data that had not, had not been in the, in the geological literature uh, where he, he uh, argued that the, uh, in North America the, uh, the, there were what he called six mega sequences, package, large packets of sediment that uh, uh, tended to be more or less complete near the continental margins on, e on the east side and west side of North America, but near the continental center, uh, they, there's only a little bit preserved. And, and uh, so the, the darker green represents preserved sediment. The uh, lighter uh, green or yellow represents missing sediment, either er eroded away or never deposited in the first place. And bounding these packages or sediment, he, he, he uh, showed, were major continent-wide erosional unconformities. That, that, uh, at, at, and the first one was at the base of what was called the Sauk mega, uh, mega sequence, most of it in the Cambrian. And, uh, and then the, there was another major global uh, erosional unconformity that bevel the continent flat and then this mega sequence was deposited and 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 similarly at the base of each one of these sequences there's a a glo a, 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 a at least a continent wide erosional event that that e e eroded the continent flat and in, in many in some cases left very little uh, of that uh, sediment at the center of the continent uh, so this was, uh, th this, this was revolutionary, this understanding of this kind of erosional history. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll t talk about this in a little bit, but I showed last week some of the evidences for this first e erosional unconformity known uh, especially in our circles as the great unconformity. Uh, and uh, it's... Uh, uh, the, 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 that bottommost layer just above the unconformity is known as the Tapete Sandstone in the Grand Canyon area, but that same layer is, is distributed all around, almost completely around North America, and uh, uh, as you see here, and, and is uh, generally very coarse at the bottom of that, in that first layer. This is, uh, this is the a shot of the Grand Canyon, this is the Tapete Sandstone, and, and you can stand on the rim of the canyon, see this layer from one horizon to the other. Uh, uh, and and at the base of this layer, the Tapete Sandstone, is the Great Unconformity, uh, major erosional unconformity. This is a, 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 a view of, the, of that boundary, that unconformity right here, where the, marked by the green arrow. And, uh, it's the contact between the uh, Tapete Sandstone and the, at this location, the, the underlying Hakatai Shale. And uh, you, note, you can note the size of the clast here at the bottom of the Tapete Sandstone. This is water, de water deposited material. It's hard for the mind to imagine that such coarse material could be carried by water and distributed over right there in the Grand Canyon, over you can see it for over 200 miles. That same layer, uh, and uh, I, I, in, in some places they're even larger classed. I showed this one, uh, a, a boulder 15 feet in diameter, weighs uh, uh, on the order of 200 tons. Again, imagining that kind of material being moved along by by water. Uh, this, is, this, this represents the onset, I believe, the onset of the flood, the, the erosional unconformity that uh, 
mark the be very beginning of, of, of the Genesis flood. Uh, last summer I was in, um, in Wisconsin and was able to see that same boundary. And again, we find huge boulders made out of the, the what under, underlies it. This is a quartzite, metamorphosed sandstone, and big chunks of it were, had been ripped away and, and lie above, right above this erosional surface here. Again, that's the, the great unconformity. Uh, another shot of that, of that boundary with the, the bedrock below and these big quartzite boulders above. So we're, we're talking about, and this is a, a, not only in North America, but a global phenomenon. Uh, it's a global unconformity. So we're talking about uh, some kind of catastrophic event uh, uh, depicted here, some, some kind of high density turbulent flow. Uh, and uh, would, would create this, uh, a, leave behind a sandy uh, debris flow deposit con containing large class uh, and s some event like this that swept across all of the North America and, 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 and in, in, in actuality across the entire continent surface of the world or a large fraction of it. Now just to help you connect with the present day, I want to I want to just show a few slides from the, uh, the tsunami that devastated Japan in March of 2011. It was a result of a magnitude 9 earthquake about 50 miles off the eastern coast. Uh, it generated a tsunami that devastated about 220 square miles of the eastern Honshu. The tsunami traveled inland as far as 6 miles at Sendai and dis, uh, displayed run-up heights of up to 128 feet above sea level in certain places. So here we see uh, at uh, this city, uh, Miyako City, the, the uh, tsunami just beginning to, to reach inland, flowing over the, the sea wall designed to protect the city from such things but not, 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 a, not a tsunami of this magnitude. And uh, here, uh, here we see a little later in time, uh, tsunami washing away buildings in Sendai, uh, Japan, moving at about 40, 40 miles an hour, 40 to 50 miles an hour, uh, and uh, a layer of water from 20 to 30 feet thick, moving inland, destroying everything in its path, essentially. Uh, this is what the what it looked like after after that uh, tsunami went through, essentially total destruction, and uh, uh, great human lo uh, loss in human life, and uh, so this, we we see this the, the the power of this kind of event. Uh, what I want to do today is present a case that tsunami-like waves but uh, of, of vastly greater magnitude with energies at least a hundred times greater than that tsunami that devastated the coast of Japan were largely responsible for the formation of the Earth's fossil bearing sediment record. So again we're we're talking about uh, I'm, I'm suggesting that a large tsunami tsunamis like waves large enough to completely uh, 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 traverse the continents uh, were responsible for these these uh, these major erosional unconformities that are seen in the in the in the geological record, and similar lesser waves, but uh, related to these big big waves, were responsible for depositing most of the sediment in these packages later on. Okay, just to give you uh, let's let's look at we saw the. The, the Tapit sandstone and its equivalents being the, the first layer laid down after that first uh, unconformity. Uh, at the base of the next, the, the next package is the uh, uh, St. Peter sandstone. It's the base of the Tippecanoe mega sequence. And this is it, the distribution of that sandstone layer in North America. And uh, we find in internal evidence, I mentioned this last week, of catastrophism uh, within the beds, within the, each mega sequence. And so uh, I, I, uh, I think I had this slide last week showing 
just the, the, the large, gigantic cross beds in uh, a number of the sandstone layers here. And I'll just quickly uh, review that. We, we saw it last week. We saw Z the, the Navajo sandstone in Zion National Park, essentially a single blanket of, of a, a gigantic sheet of sand that once stretched from Southern California to Central Wyoming, from Idaho to New Mexico. Enough sand in that, in that blanket to uh, cover the whole state of Texas to a depth of almost 300 feet. So just a, a staggering uh, deposit, sedimentary deposits like this. See the, the uh, cross bedding in the Navajo sandstone here in a, in a feature known as the wave near the Utah-Arizona border. And the size and speed of the water currents needed to generate such large dune structures is challenging for our minds to imagine. Uh, another, the next layer down in that er earlier slide was the Shinnerup conglomerate. This is the distribution of that conglomerate layer. It's, uh, it's generally, it doesn't have, it has uh, lots of roughly an inch in diameter quartz and quartzite class in it. And uh, uh, this is, a, a, this is a, a, a shot of the cross bedding there north of Flagstaff. This is what that material looks like up close. Again, water, you need high velocity water to uh, keep this kind of coarse material in suspension and distribute it in that uniform layer over that large an area. Again, speaking of, of uh, just incredible uh, water catastrophism. The next layer down I showed was the Coconino sandstone. Again, uh, strongly cross bedded here. You see it in the foreground and also across the on the north rim, rim of the Grand Canyon here. Uh, I, uh, it extends east several hundred miles. This is that same layer uh, 65 miles east of Albuquerque. They're known as the Glorietta Sandstone. This is the distribution of the Coconino. Um, uh, has, a, has a volume here just in this in this region shown on the map of about 100,000 cubic miles. Uh, and uh, so, so we're talking about deposition, transport and deposition of sedimentary units that just, it's hard to imagine. No, no modern analog of anything like this occurring on Earth today. Uh, one final, one more uh, large deposit I show. Th this is the Morrison Sandstone in which uh, lots of the trophy dinosaurs have been found, the dinosaur skeletons. Uh, and uh, so it, it also covers a huge area. And uh, I think I mentioned, I may have mentioned last week, two weeks ago, this, this has an amazing amount of, of volcanic ash in it, indicative of huge volcanoes erupting to the west, probably where the Sierra Nevadas are now located uh, providing the volcanic ash that uh, makes up a significant fraction of the volume of this sedimentary layer. Uh, this, these are some of the dinosaur bones preserved in the Morrison Formation uh, at Dinosaur National Monument, uh, uh, just east of Vernal, Utah, and just across into Colorado. So uh, here's a map of the sediment thickness uh, on the earth today and the average I mentioned earlier is about 1800 meters. Uh, the thickest accumulations are on the continental shelves and I believe it's a result of the runoff during the final stages of the flood. So we have very thick uh, uh, accumulations of sediment in the Gulf of Mexico along, along the Atlantic coast up here uh, off the north slope of Alaska and in various other, other places around the world and and despite uh, uh, and, and you know significant depositions here in, in, in mid-continent America nothing compared to these kind of depths but s still tens of thousands of feet in these in these basins okay so uh, the the research ob objective of this project that I undertook about three years ago was to uh, develop a numerical simulation tool for the large scale erosion, transport, and sedimentation processes that operated during the Genesis flood. 
And I presented this work last summer at the uh, International Conference on Creationism in Pittsburgh. Now, uh, I, uh, on one hand, I apologize for, I'm, I'm going to try to describe, I take, I've taken out m most of the equations, but I left a few in. Describe this numerical model to you. There are lots of academics here today, so uh, I, I, I did keep some equations in for your benefit. All right, so let me summarize what this numerical model entails. It's based upon a code that I developed at Los Alamos in the, in the 1990s that solves what are called the shallow water equations on the surface of a rotating sphere. Uh, I'll explain that a little more. It assumes that the dominant means for sediment transport during the flood was by turbulent, rapidly flowing water. And uh, so the theory of open channel turbulent flow is applied to treat the suspension, transport, and deposition of the sediment. So I draw heavily upon a, a well some well-developed theory called open channel flow. Uh, and for erosion, I assume that cavitation is the dominant process responsible for the erosion of bedrock as well as for erosion of already deposited sediment. Uh, and as initial working hypothesis, I use tidal forcing for, the, uh, for driving the water, for, for actually accelerating the water, driving the water, forming these, uh, these large tsunami-like waves. Okay, so let's uh, a little, uh, little more on this theory of open channel flow. In hydraulic engineering, the topic of large-scale erosion, sediment transport, and deposition by a layer of turbulent, rapidly moving water is in the general category of open channel flow. This topic is one of great practical interest and one that has been studied experimentally for many years. Uh, some examples of, of where this uh, theory applies uh, it, it, uh, include uh, open channel, include rivers, tidal currents, irrigation channels, and just sheets of water running across the ground surface after a rain. The equations commonly used to model such flows are anchored in experimental measurements and decades of validation in many diverse applications. Uh, the experiments show that except for the immediate vicinity of the boundary between the water and the ground, the mean velocity profile in the turbulent water is very close to being a logarithmic function of the distance from the boundary. I have a, the next, next uh, slide shows a plot of this. Uh, to, to a good approximation, the mean velocity, that is the total velocity with the turbulent, turbulent fluctuations subtracted away, as a function of height, z above the boundary is given by this formula here, where, where it's, a, it's a function of the log, the constant times a function times the logarithm of the height uh, scaled by some some reference uh, uh, distance. This this z zero uh, is the uh, bottom boundary. Uh, uh, yeah, the zero is going to be the bottom boundary. Z equals zero is the bottom boundary. All right, u, t, u, u tau is a quantity known as the turbulent friction velocity. I'll say a little more about that. And this Z-naught is is, has to do with the boundary roughness and is, is usually a number like a centimeter or so. Uh, you don't, don't need to worry about some of these details. It, what I'm showing is you can, you can model the velocity as a, as a function of height in this layer of, of moving water uh, very well, the theory shows, uh, simply as a logarithmic function shown here. So here's a plot of that of that function, as a function as a function of height, and uh, and this is this is the uh, the ratio of this uh, of the velocity the mean velocity divided by this friction velocity. So you see it increases in this this way, and uh, and you get far enough away from the boundary, it's essentially constant with height. Okay, so here's the definition. Uh, you can just simply invert this equation for this u tau and plug in the, the thickness, the eight height thickness of the water layer, and uh, and you, you can, and so this if you ha if you know what the thickness of the layer is, 
and what the uh, what the velocity what, what the velocity in in the free in the free 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 flow regime near the top of the layer. If you know those two numbers, you can compute this friction velocity, uh, and uh, it basically measures the uh, vigor of the turbulent flow. Uh, now, the uh, suspension of sediment particles in a, in a turbulent flow occurs when the vertical vo velocity fluctuation due to turbulence. You have a lot of eddies uh, moving around causing up and down motion. That, that vertical, statistical vertical uh, velocity fluctuation needs to be at least as large as the vertical settling velocity of the particles uh, for you to have s a suspension. And a, a, pr a quantity known as the Rouse parameter uh, involving the ratio of the particle settling speed to this uh, velocity u tau uh, uh, defined this way, this Rouse parameter is commonly used to, as a criterion uh, for suspension. Uh, again, based on experiment, it's found that if if uh, if uh, if this uh, Rouse parameter is less than one, there is full suspension. Uh, and uh, but but uh, note that this Rouse parameter depends on particle size. So uh, in order to do this modeling. Uh, uh, realistically, it's 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 necessary to uh, uh, divide the sediment up into several sediment classes, and uh, I, I use three classes for this initial investigation: fine sand, medium si sand, and coarse sand. And uh, I'll show in the calculations what how the sand, uh, the fine sand, is suspended longer than the coarser sand, as you would hope. Uh, so I'm going to, dispensing with further mathematical details, it turns out that given the thickness and speed of the water layer, we can compute its sediment carrying capacity for each particle size. OK. So what about erosion? How do we treat erosion? The erosion model is very simple. Since our interest is capturing the most salient aspects of the, of the cataclysm in which water velocities reach several tens of meters per second, we neglect erosion processes at low water velocities and instead focus on cavitation driven erosion, which occurs at higher water velocities and re results in extreme erosion rates. Cavitation involves the formation of water vapor and air bubbles, which involves, uh, uh, which occurs when local fluid pressure drops below the vapor pressure of dissolved air in the water. So you have in this in this turbulent flow where you have big pressure fluctuations, there can be regions in that in that flow where uh, uh, where uh, where you have bubbles spontaneously occurring in in regions of low pressure. All right, cavitation damage occurs when these bubbles that are generated suddenly collapse in the vicinity of, of a rock water interface. And when these bubbles collapse, there's a pressure spike. They, 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 they collapse violently and produce a pulse of pressure. And these pressure spikes generated by the collapse of the, the bubbles are typically on the order of seven, several thousand atmospheres of pressure. Such pressures pulses exceed the sheer strength of most silicate minerals. So you, it's, it's like little, um, uh, minute, little microscopic explosions, but extremely uh, intense. And, the, and these, these can shatter individual crystals and rapidly reduce solid rock to powder, to small, very small fragments. So this, this, uh, this, uh, this process is a, is a potent process when it kicks in. Uh, now it's been, been it's standard in trying to model cavitation to use a very simple formula like this, where the erosion rate, the degradation rate in, in if you're talking about a rock surface in, in uh, meters per second or microns per second is, is uh, proportional to a constant 
times the difference between the, the, the velocity, water velocity, and a threshold, cavitation threshold velocity, raised to a, 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 an exponent. And uh, typically this is, well, I, I use a value of 15 meters per second. So if this is uh, 100 meters per second, uh, you're going to get a pretty large number here. And it's experimentally been found that uh, this Q can be as large as seven. Many people recommend a, a value of six, and that's what I use in the, in the code, uh, value of six for this exponent. So you see that for large values of U, the rate of, of erosion goes as the sixth power, close to the sixth power of velocity. Uh, when the bed material is, is sediment and not crystalline bedrock, we use the same parameters as for solid rock, uh, except that we increase the erosion rate by a factor of five. That may be, that's conservative. It's likely that erosion rate would be much higher than five times what it is for uh, crystalline rock. Uh, so, in, and we have tests to ensure that all the ex existing sediment cover is eroded before any bedrock erosion occurs. And we assume that the cavitation degrades bedrock into distributional particle sizes corresponding to 70% fine sand, 20% uh, medium sand, and 10% coarse sand, according to the standard definitions for these, uh, for these different particle sizes. Okay. Now, uh, what about the, just computing the time-dependent water flow? To model the water flow of the Earth, uh, we uh, utilize what are known as the shallow water equations uh, and uh, in the context of a rotating sphere since the Earth is rotating. By shallow water, it is understood that the water depth is everywhere small compared to the horizontal dimensions of interest. In other words, for these equations to be applicable, you need the, 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 the thickness of the water layer to be small relative to the relevant horizontal dimensions. So in the Earth, the, the deep ocean basins are typically uh, on the order of about four kilometers, 4,000 meters, or 12 or 13,000 feet uh, deep. But we're talking about horizontal dimensions. I, I, the, the dimension I use in my code, I have grid points spaced 120 kilometers apart. So uh, the water, so the, the, the requirements for these equations are easily met. And actually, I'm interested in mainly in the water layer on top of the continents where the erosion is occurring. And in that case, the water layer is only typically a few hundred meters thick. So that, and for that, for, for the situation over the continents, the shallow water conditions are, are met very well. Uh, these equations basically enforce conservation of mass and momentum. And, uh, and solving these equations yields the, 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 the height, of the thickness of the layer, and the velocity at every grid point in the computational grid. Uh, this approach involves a single layer of water with laterally varying thickness. What otherwise would be an expensive 3D problem now becomes a much more tractable 2D problem. So it's, uh, it's not prohibitive to, uh, to, uh, to do these calculations. And uh, so I apologize. I, I, I am showing a few equations. But just to give you a, a flavor for what, what has to be solved, these, these are the shallow water equations here. Uh, and the, the top one is simply an expression of the conservation of mass. And the second one is uh, simply the conservation of linear momentum. Uh, and it's, the, the, this is, uh, okay, I'll explain what these terms are. This is the cor what's called the Coriolis term, where uh, the momentum is influenced by the Earth's rotation. And this is a pressure gradient term, which depends on the, on the, on the height of the surface. So here, H is the water depth. Uh, U is the horizontal velocity. Uh, F is what's called the Coriolis parameter, equal to uh, uh, 2 times the ro Earth's rotation rate times sine of theta, where theta is, theta is the uh, latitude. 
Uh, K is the outward radial vector pointing up. Uh, G is the gravitational acceleration. H cross is the height of the free surface above, above some spherical reference surface. If uh, HT denotes topography on the on the bottom on the bottom of the layer, then this H cross is equal to H plus HT. So anyway, uh, uh, and then just to some explain what some of these other symbols mean, the D slash DT operators, the uh, material or uh, substantial or co-moving time rate of change of an individual parcel of fluid. Uh, so it's the rate of change of height of the of a parcel of fluid. This uh, grad operator, del operator, is the spherical horizontal gradient operator. And the del star operator is the spherical horizontal divergence operator. Um, basically telling you if you've got if you have a control volume, whether you've got material moving in or out of that volume, or whether it's uh, so. Uh, okay, two additional terms are included in the momentum equation to account for bottom friction and for turbulence on scales not resolved by the grid. So there are actually are two other terms I've not shown here in the in the momentum equation. Okay, the the grid that I use, the computational grid is constructed from uh, what's called the regular icosahedron. It provides an almost uniform discretization of the spherical surface. Uh, the resolution we use, I used in these calculations have uh, about 41,000 cells with the average cell width of about 120 kilometers over the surface of the Earth. So uh, a huge issue here in this kind of modeling is what conceivable force could have driven the water strongly enough to have caused the amount of erosion, sediment transport, and deposition evident from the rock record within the brief time interval uh, of the flood. So uh, uh, I considered, I looked at several candidate mechanisms. The large lateral extent that characterizes a significant fraction of the continental uh, sediment layers appears almost certainly to require forces acting coherently over large spatial scales. Okay, let's try to say that more simply. We saw these the, the laterally extensive formations. <laughs> to produce those, those coherent uh, large la laterally extensive formation requires some, some uh, force, some mechanism operating more or less uni coherently and uniformly over those large scales. What are, are the candidate mechanisms that could accelerate the water covering much of the earth in a manner that would cause sheets of water coherent on large spatial scales to sweep over the continents uh, at speeds of many tens of meters per second? So uh, a few years back, I, I looked at the possibility that the earth might have flipped during the flood and uh, looked at you know what that you know that is at least thinkable would that is that possible is that adequate for doing it I came to the conclusion no the accelerations are simply too small that 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 could not have played a, a major role what about asteroid impacts into the oceans again the answer is no it doesn't involve it, it doesn't create enough uh, wave height uh, to do it and there's a good good book written on that by Mater, 2004. Uh, what about torques from a pa passing, passing planetary body? Uh, torques acting on the Earth? Again, the answer is no. The only, the only mechanism I could identify uh, were, was a tidal mechanism, tides raised by a passing body. And I, I found it needed to be at least on the order of the size of the moon to raise a large enough tide to, uh, to drive the current strongly enough. So, so maybe uh, Donald Patton was right. Uh, in, in, a, in a sense, yes. I have avoided, I might say I've, I've strongly resisted these, these, uh, these scenarios involving extra planetary bodies. But uh, I finally had to give in and I had to admit I can't, I, can't, I can't come up with a mechanism uh, apart from that. So I'm, I have changed my outlook a little bit. 
All right, let's, uh, let's look at the, the equation for, for uh, the tide that a passing body raises uh, is uh, given by this formula here. The, the H tide as a function of angle is given by this, this formula here, uh, where ME is the mass of the Earth, A is the Earth's radius, phi is the angle between a given point on the Earth's surface and the line connecting the center of the Earth and the center of the passing body. Note that the tidal height is maximum when phi is zero here. So when, 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 uh, when phi is zero, uh, uh, cosine, the co cosine term becomes one, and you get just one for this uh, expression in parenthesis. And then, so, so this then gives the height of the tide, this, this, uh, this ratio here. And uh, for, a, for a mass one one hundredth of the mass of the Earth, and if we want a, a tidal height of 2,500 meters, we find that the distance separating the body from the center of the Earth is uh, about 19,000 kilometers, or about 11,000 miles, which, by the way, is outside the Roche limit. It, that's important because you don't want the, the, the solid body tide acting on the body to cause it to uh, uh, break apart. So, and it turns out the, the mass of the moon is, is, is close to 1%. It's 1.23% uh, of the mass of the Earth. So a body, body needs to be something on the order, uh, have, a, have a mass on the order of that of the moon for it to give this large a tide. All right, so, and I found I needed a tide of that magnitude to drive the, to create enough uh, erosion and sediment. Uh, all right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show some calculations now. Uh, and uh, so I've got this illustrative case. Uh, and I, I choose a, a, a simple geometry of a single circular continent. So I, I, I go to a very simple case, a large, one single continent. centered. It's going to be centered at the equator and also centered at zero degrees lati uh, longitude. Uh, covering 38% of the Earth's surface, roughly the amount of land surface we have today. And the ocean region surrounding the continent is taken to have a uniform depth of 4,000 meters below the mean sea level. And the height of the continent at its center is 150 meters relative to mean sea level. So the center of the continent is not submerged. It's above sea level initially. And, it, and, the, and the surface smoothly decreases to be 24 meters below sea level at its edge. So it's a dome-shaped continent, very mildly dome-shaped. Uh, 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 150 meters is, or 174 meters from the edge to the center is not very much relative to uh, several thousand kilometers in, in its uh, radius. So. Uh, the continental surface is assumed everywhere to consist of crystalline bedrock initially. So there's no initial sediment on the, on the continent. Initially, the water is at rest with its surface at sea level. So that's how the, that's the, that's a picture of the starting condition. Uh, at the beginning of the calculation, it is assumed that a body with a mass of 1% of that of the Earth, uh, or at least 1%, makes a near approach uh, across a point at 90 degrees east and 30 degrees north so as to raise a, a 2,500 meter, uh, meter tide at that location and also it produces a, a similar tide, a, sa a same amplitude tide on the opposite side of the Earth. The gravitational potential energy of these tidal bulges as they collapse drives uh, huge waves that radiate away from the points where the bulges originated. These waves impinge upon the continent, causing intense erosion. The flow pattern becomes complex as the waves interact with one another and with this high standing continent. So, so I'm going to si simulate that. The sediment generated from, the bedrock, from bedrock erosion is suspended in the turbulent water that quickly spreads across the continent's surface. Wherever the suspended sediment load exceeds the carrying capacity of the turbulent flow, sediment deposition occurs. 
once a sediment layer is present, it is vulnerable to being uh, eroded, suspended, and transported uh, elsewhere before being, well, before being redeposited elsewhere. Uh, uh, another aspect of this is that bedrock erosion and sediment deposition generate topographical relief on the continent surface, relief that also affects the pattern of water flow. These highly dynamical processes continue until friction between the moving water and the Earth's surface dissipates the gravitational potential energy of the tide and the water spe speeds become too small to drive the strongly erosive turbulent water any longer. So this is a, uh, this is a animation of, of a calculation. It's, uh, it's running, running out to uh, uh, five days of time. And uh, what's shown is the uh, is the, the the height of the water that the, the little arrows are, are the water velocities. So what we have early on, we have a, t a, a tide coming in from this direction, one from from the opposite direction, and it has a pulse of uh, high water and heavy erosion that comes in, sweeps, doesn't sweep all the way to the center of the continent, but uh, comes a, a, a significant distance in. Uh, so that, that is showing the, uh, the, uh, the height of the water above, above mean sea level. Okay, all right, now, uh, I'm going to show that that gives you a starting idea of what the solution is like. I want to show some snapshots for, uh, in these next slides, spaced 12 hours apart, of this same calculation that show uh, one, the amount of suspended sediment in the turbulent flow. Secondly, the cumulative amount of bedrock erosion as a function of location then the net amount of sediment remaining on the continental surface as a result of deposition and erosion, and then finally the top topography of the continental surface as erosion and deposition, and I also include some isostatic compensation, uh, act jointly together to alter the, the height. The, uh, I, I might mention the peak water speeds over this two-day interval range from about 270 meters down to about 100 meters per second. Or in other words, we've got some uh, very high velocities uh, in miles per hour, 600 miles per hour down to about 20, 220 miles per hour, far beyond the cavitational onset value of 15 meters per second. So we're, we're talking about uh, water speeds of a, like that of a jet plane uh, and, and, uh, and, and, a, and, and a layer of water several hundred feet thick uh, uh, actually can be several hundred meters thick. Uh, the turbulent surges of water that sweep across the continent during this interval are of sufficient depth and speed to suspend, suspend more than a hundred meters of sediment in certain regions and to transport it for thousands of kilometers. So in this layer of turbulent water, uh, there are places where more than 100 meters of solid sediment is suspended in the water column. Uh, yeah, and, and that's necessary to get to, 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 f f to generate enough, a thick enough sediment column at the end. However, drag from the stationary continent surface on the moving water dissipates its kinetic energy, especially when it becomes shallow. Much of the erosion occurs along the edge of the continent where surges from the ocean basin impinge upon the edge of the continent. Erosion and deposition also alter the continent's topography, which in turn affect the flow and the flow's sediment carrying capacity. So here is a um, uh, uh, four snapshots in time showing the amount of, of uh, suspended sediment in the water. And so the, uh, I'm going to try to use, get my arrow working if I can, yeah. And uh, uh, so we have a, a scale. I've cut the cut the scale off at a, at a maximum of 30 meters of, of sediment in the column, just to be able to see things a little better. 
Is the circle the continent rather than the whole Earth's surface? The, the, I'm sorry, I should have pointed it out. The, I'm looking, I'm looking at the, at the at, it's an orthographic projection of, of the sphere, and, and it's, it, the center is at the center of the continent. But the continent only goes to near the edge. Let me get my arrow back. It, it, it go, this is where, where the red here changes to blue, that's the edge of the continent. So the, the, the continent fills most of the frame here, most of the circle. Okay, so we have these waves coming in here at something like 270 meters per second, the peak amplitude in this, in this uh, frame A. In B, uh, we, uh, the Coriolis force is, is, is kicking in, the complexity of it starting to appear. You've got a, a pulse moving across here. Um, and, and the, you know, as time goes by, this is after, after one day, 24 hours. This is after uh, 36 hours. A, a complex pattern, the velocities has now dropped to 100 and momentarily down, the maximum velocity is down at like 113 meters per second. This is at two days, and there's somewhere, somewhere there's a big arrow at 200 meters per second. But you see the, uh, uh, as time goes by, the, the sediment is settling out, and there's less and less uh, sediment in suspension the, the, the longer you go here. Okay. The next slide displays, displays the lateral distribution of suspended sediment for each sediment class at a time of one day. So now I'm going to break it up. The, the, the last slide was the total amount of sediment. Now I'm going to break it up into the three sediment classes. And so here is the, the first one, A, is fine sand. The next one is medium sand. And the next, the, this C, is, is coarse sand. Uh, the fine sand uh, has a diameter of uh, 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 0.063 millimeters. Uh, the medium sand, a, a quarter of a millimeter. And the coarse sand, uh, a mean diameter of one millimeter. So you can see that. Uh, 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 at this time, the uh, coarse sand is only, is only in suspension near where the erosion is taking place, and it, it, it falls out r rather quickly, whereas the, the fine sand continues to stay in suspension. So uh, gives you just, just to show you that the, the code is tracking all of this. Okay. Uh, this is, this, is, this pl plot shows the bedrock erosion, the cumulative, uh, uh, cumulative bedrock erosion. So you can see where the bedrock has been eroded. And there's uh, this initial pulse erodes, erodes uh, these, these regions right here very heavily and uh, around the edge heavily. All right. And then as time proceeds, this, this pulse that comes out here erodes the top of the continent fairly heavily. But then, uh, as time goes on, the water vo velocities decrease. There's not much more additional erosion after, after about a day and a half. There's not much difference between these two frames, between one and a half and two days. So the, the erosion is over pretty quickly. It's, it's really driven by the most uh, highest velocity water. Now, this, is, uh, this plot shows the four snapshots of the amount, the thickness of the deposited sediment. So this is the net deposited sediment. Once it gets deposited, it's vulnerable to being eroded again. So, but this is the net, what, what remains. So we see there's not much that actually is deposited here at, uh, relatively speaking, after 12 hours. Quite a bit after t 24 hours, even more after 36 hours and even more after two days as it settles out. So you get a flavor for, for uh, those different. Uh, so this is the, uh, this is the uh, a movie of that accumulated sediment that I just showed. And uh, I'll let it repeat. You can, again, see that it, uh, uh, And this is, this is running out to five days, okay? Now, uh, what about the topography? 
All right, this, this shows a, uh, how, how, the, the positive, how the topography gets altered. Uh, this, this yellow here represents the original dome shape of the, of the continent. And these bluer regions are where it's been eroded, where, where the continent has been cut away. And so you, uh, and, and the red is where there's been, th these lighter colors are where its sediment has been deposited. So you have a hill, a big mountain, if you will, of sediment here in these places. So this is, the, it shows that the topography is being altered by both erosion and sedimentation. Okay. So I'm gonna, the next slide shows uh, uh, these four things uh, after five days. And uh, the average depth of sediment at, at five days here is 157 meters. And the average velocity of the water flow is down to 20 meters per second. And the amount of sediment in suspension on average is about a little less than five meters. So this, this is uh, snapshots after five days. We, those other slides were after two days. This is after five days, not very much uh, material in suspension after five days. Uh, the uh, cumulative erosion has uh, changed a little bit. Uh, the uh, accumulated uh, sedimentation deposited is, uh, I've changed the scale, now this is this has a maximum of 350 meters, so uh, you can see some of these uh, where some of the large, dep large amounts of accumulation are. And this is the uh, topography. Uh, and so I, can, I, I also ran this out to 30 days. And, and because there's ongoing erosion, ongoing currents keep, keep moving around, uh, we have more and more sediment and by by 30 days we have a t total of 378 meters and the vo water velocity is down to 17 meters per second okay um, so uh, and so this is what it looks like at 30 days I'm running out of time I'm just about finished what can what inferences can we draw from these experiments well one important result is the average depth of seven sediment 380 meters represents only a small fraction of the observed total of observed amount of Phanerozoic sediment on the continents today. Uh, that, so that's a problem. Another problem is that the vast majority of erosion transport and deposition unfolds in a time interval much shorter than the Genesis flood narrative describes. So uh, <coughs> what, what I uh, and I say that there's we, we we, there's physical reasons why we can't get by going to a larger body or la larger tide that just doesn't appear to work and, and moreover we have this rec from our record we saw that one, there wasn't just one pulse but six so, so if, we, if we go to six pulses six tidal pulses uh, it turns out that the subsequent pulses don't produce quite as much sediment as the first one but uh, they average about 280 meters of sediment per pulse on the subsequent pulses. So if we add it up, we get close, close to the 1,800 meters with, with these parameters for, uh, for six pulses. Uh, so this is, a, let me just emphasize, this is a very crude initial attempt to try to get, to try to scope the problem, trying to get some rough idea of what might have happened. Uh, and uh, so there are many important phenomena that are missing entirely in this uh, scenario. So details about what's going on at the surface uh, and, and the kinds of debris flows that almost certainly are going on at the surface uh, are not even in included in, yet in the model. Some of the features that the treatment does not as yet include uh, uh, I don't, and there's no, apart from this small, small amount of dome-shaped surface, no initial continent, continental topography. The Bible talks about high mountains, so there are not, no mountains initially, uh, nor any dynamic topography, uh, nor any uh, easily eroded sediment initially present on the continents, uh, nor any uh, 
dynamic changes in the depth of the ocean basin, which we saw last week with catastrophic plate tectonics is significant, nor any changes to the lateral location of the continent blocks. This is just one single supercontinent. It doesn't, have, it doesn't account for the blocks, uh, the, the supercontinent breaking up and moving around, the parts moving around, nor does it uh, account for, as I said, the, any kind of dra get gravity dri driven debris flows, uh, nor any effects of chemically depositive sediment, uh, nor any contributions from plucking or suspended load abrasion to the bedrock. Uh, so other, other, other erosional processes could be added. And there's a whole long list of things that are not yet included. In addition, there's multiple possibilities for the choice of direction for the flyby of the extraterrestrial body, each of which le leads to a, uh, a different time history. So uh, in summary, uh, I, 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 I'm persuaded that the flood sediments we observe covering much of today's continent surface require water motion similar to those I have attempted to model in this research effort. The laterally extensive sedimentary formations appear to demand some sort of very large scale tsunami-like water motions able to sweep entirely across large continents. The continent scale unconformities that separate the mega sequences also strongly point to that conclusion. It's my prayer that God will place on someone's heart to pick up where I've left off in these modest attempts and uh, carry it forward. I, I, I sense there are major new insights just waiting to be discovered. Um, and uh, so I believe a credible defense of the flood is crucial today in defending the entire Christian worldview, uh, as I said last week, and that there are these strongholds that, the, that Satan has raised up against the knowledge of God. And right at the center is uniformitarian geology, which rejects the global flood, rejects the Noah's flood. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and yet we are called, it says, Paul says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of strongholds, uh, like the ones I showed in the previous picture, destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So uh, if you want more, if you want to, more information, I would point you to my own website where most of my work is published, logosresearchassociates.org. And I will try to have this paper pub posted. It's not currently posted. It's, it, it has been posted on the uh, ICC, International Conference on creationism website. Anyway, thank you for your attention, and I guess we'll have a, for those that want to stay, some questions. Thanks. Uh, you're describing huge amounts of turbulence, so it begs the question how do we have any articulated skeletons given that amount of turbulence? I guess you're saying as it comes in, to the, in the middle of the continent, then it's less turbulent, and so then we can still find articulated that's, skeletons, that's, or what? That's uh, an, obvious, an obvious issue, and, and uh, I, I, th I think the way we answer it is, uh, is not just uh, armchair speculation, but actually trying to model these processes uh, a little, you know, in a serious way. I, I, uh, 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 you know, we. Uh, I, I see a lot of there was there were some structures preserved in the in these uh, in the Japanese tsunami, and a lot of debris floating around after the after the initial tsunami went through. I, I don't have I don't know I don't have a good answer. Oh, can you? Uh uh, back up and leave that last slide up with the website. Okay. On. Thank you. Okay, I want to uh, ask, ask, and I really don't know where to begin here. Uh, I have actually a whole lot of questions, and, and let me kind of explain where I'm coming from. 
uh, Ernest Nagel defines science, the uh, methodology of science, as a persistent critique of the claims that are asserted as true. And in Thessalonians, we're told, uh, the King James Version puts it, uh, prove all things. Uh, other translations puts it as uh, examine everything carefully. So what I'm simply trying to do here is be, number one, a scientist, and number two, uh, a Christian. All right, now, I'd like to come back to the, the uh, idea of plate tectonics occurring during the period of the flood. Now, uh, you pointed out several times, well, let me back up. Wagner used uh, the fossils that were common on South America and Africa and what have you, uh, strata that were common, and also he used uh, uh, glacial debris that was common. And, and when you put the continents back into Pangaea, all of it fits. Now, when you separate these continents that occurred during the flood, uh, as, as you are asserting, and, and, and I'm not trying to challenge that question. I'm just trying to resolve some of the problems that it creates. Uh, if the strata were laid down by the flood, how do we get matching strata on the Atlantic side and the uh, African side, as well as matching fossils and matching uh, glacial debris. Secondly, you, you pointed out in one of your slides that most of the uh, uh, strata that was laid down was laid down on the continental shelf. If that separation occurred during the flood and, and that strata was being laid down, what prevented that strata from going into the, the actual ocean basin, you know. Let's, let's take one, at a t one question at a time. Okay. Uh, first of all, the, uh, the, the issue of the, uh, the su all this evidence that the southern continents were once together, the, the commonality of, of uh, plant, plant types, uh, the, uh, the, the tree, what was it, Glos Glossopteris, uh, fa uh, fauna, Common to all those southern, all, and the you know some of the some of the animals, uh, what was Mesosaurus, uh, common on all those continent blocks. Uh, you know those are those are Paleozoic, uh, essentially Paleozoic fossils when the when the continent was still intact. So there's no difference in the in catastrophic plate tectonics scenario and the standard. Uh, plate tectonic scenario on uh, why the why why you have the fo the common fossils and uh, you know when the breakup occurred. Okay. So, so uh, the no, no, wait a minute. The, in the in the flood scenario, the breakup did not occur until uh, well into well into the Mesozoic. So okay. So then, then basically, you're saying that those fossils were laid down pre-flood. No, they were laid down early in the flood before the continent broke apart. The, pro the, the continent didn't break. I, I, I may have missed, in trying to simplify things, I may have misled you that the, 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 the scenario that I modeled starts in the Mesozoic. I, I'm not showing the, the plate motion in the Paleozoic. And during the Paleozoic, Gondwana land remained intact. So, so throughout the Paleozoic, Gondwana, the southern continents, remained together. They were not uh, influenced by the breakup that took place uh, that involved the northern continents, Laurentia, uh, uh, Baltica, and Siberia, that broke apart and then came back again during the Paleozoic in the north. In the south, they, th those continents remained intact, so you had the you had all of the Paleozoic fossil record, all the commonality of fo fossils across the southern continent. All of that is, uh, you know, takes place uh, within this, within both versions of plate tectonics, the standard version and the catastrophic version. It's not until the Mesozoic that the that the southern continent breaks apart, and and at that point, all of that 
Paleozoic fossil bearing record is, has already been deposited on those southern continents. Are you tracking with me? Yeah, I am. But okay. my question now is, at what point in the flood did plate tectonics actually begin? I believe uh, plate tectonics began uh, at the beginning of the flood. But it didn't affect uh, Gondwana land. It affected the, uh, the, the, the northern part of the, of the initial supercontinent. And he broke, bro broke three big pieces away. And, and it opened up what is called, the, some people, the Proto-Atlantic or the Eopetus Ocean, separating uh, n North America and Europe. That, 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 was, uh, that was, you know, as, as the North American chunk moved away, the, the European chunk moved away, and then a, a Siberian chunk also moved away. There was ocean formed, and then that ocean closed up in the latter part of the Paleozoic to form Pangaea. So that was going on in the early part of the flood, uh, and uh, and uh, you know, and and against again the the uh, fossil similarities, the the, uh, the 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 sediment similarities uh, are the same in both versions of plate tectonics. The only difference is the uh, the uh, the speed at which it all unfolded. Okay, now my second question, why is these, the, uh, if the, the all right. continents had separated, why didn't some of that strata go out into all right. the... Uh, in, in general, in general uh, sediment, sediment transport requires uh, moderate water velocities. Sediment, t sediment tends to, to settle out of suspension. Even clay flocculates creating sand-sized particles which tend to settle out ra rather quickly. So uh, even in today's world, most of the deposition occurs uh, on the continents. Uh, but by the time you get out to the deep ocean, the water depth is so large that the, the current velocities become very small. And so uh, the, uh, in, the, in the rivers, the, the rivers, as the, as the velocity falls, the sediment uh, it, it falls to the bottom, it precipitates. And, and uh, so basically, uh, you don't get much deposition uh, in deep water. It, all the deposition is in shallow water. Okay. One more. Simple answer. Sim simple <coughs> issue. What happened? You, you were talking about the moon. Mm -hmm. What happened to the statement that God caused a strong wind to blow as the moving of the waters of the flood? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think that's entirely independent of them. Well, as far as I have thought about it, I, 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 I haven't thought there was any connection between the, these tides and the wind. I think the wind was some other, some other phenomenon. And I don't have a good idea of, of of, uh, of the role of the wind in this whole s scenario. Would heating and cooling have a problem with that? Uh, would heating and cooling be a source of the winds? Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, uh, most wind today is a result of, of uh, well, first of all, pressure gradients, which are Usually, or all, where, where temperature di differences play a major role. Yeah. If I can ask, uh, uh, you initially modeled a circular continent. Um, is the original continent uh, viewed by most people who believe in slow, the slow version of te plate tectonics? Is the original con uh, continent roughly circular? Uh, it's it's uh, there, there's as far as the western the western margin the uh, I'd say the, the the northern western and southern margin is you know not that much doesn't deviate that much from a circle the eastern the eastern margin it appears there was a something uh, later became the Tethys Sea. A major indention on the east that may have existed, 
So uh, uh, the, the re reconstructions are, are not that good to know what the, uh, what the, what the, what the continent distribution was back in, you know, uh, in the late proto, uh, proto, Proterozoic. Uh, I, I say I don't know. I don't think anybody else has a good. I think the the uh, the data are too too poor to be very confident about any of these reconstructions that go much past the uh, early Mesozoic. I just wondered if you had tried modeling a uh, sort I, of semicircular. I, I it, it would be. It's not hard uh, in this particular set of experiments, no, I've not done so. I have done, uh, w using the shallow water code, I have modeled other continent shapes. I've, I've, modeled, uh, I've modeled one that's s sort of like a, a Pangean shape with an indin indentation on the east side. I've modeled a, uh, a distribution of circular continents, several, several uh, circular continents uh, in, in relatively close proximity just to see what would happen. Uh, but I've not done it with in this, uh, you know, in this scenario. Yeah. One last question. Now, you mentioned that uh, you had these high tides that kind of then flattened out and sent uh, tidal waves all over, um, which I guess would be literal tidal waves at this point. Um, Uh, how if if a planet or planet size or moon sized body came that close to the earth uh, how long would it be that close to the earth to raise those kinds of tides it, it's, uh, it's it 's it's on the order of an hour or two okay, so in other words it 's coming through and going shoo right, right on by, right. and then the tides come and then they collapse. I want, want to thank you for such a wonderful presentation. Your, your contribution is great. Uh, one little question uh, I would raise about the slosh diagram, you know, talks about sediments being thicker on the east coast and the west coast. Uh, if the continents are together, is there a problem with those sediments being thicker on the east coast? Uh, probably. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I haven't looked into it. That was, uh, you know, th that those diagrams were published in the 60s. And, uh, you know, it was later verified that this same pattern exists on the other continents. And I, I, uh, I ought to search the literature. I have to say I haven't done so to see if there's a global, if, there, if there's now a global map, if, there's, mm -hmm. if anybody's produced a global uh, version of, of Slossy's uh, map. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, I would say uh, early on, well, probably at that time there was a, um, well, I, I'd have to look into it. It was the, the breakup, the breakaway of Laurentia occurred pretty early in the, uh, uh, in the uh, maybe either the late uh, Proterozoic or the or sometime in the Cambrian. So uh, I, I, I would need to look at that. But it, yes, potentially that could be a, an issue. I, I just raised one, one other question here about uh, the basic mechanism. Uh, of course, we don't know. We do know that the flood occurred exactly at the right time. And there had to be some divine intervention uh, unless you want to attribute it to extreme coincidences, which we're not always comfortable with. Um, is it possible that convection currents inside the Earth were accelerated to bring down uh, continents a little bit or something to bring this on instead of uh, a move? I mean, either is possible. Uh, I'm just uh, curious. Well. Uh, about that, just simply changing the the height of the con uh, of the continents is uh, is not enough. Somehow you've got to accelerate the water. You've got to m get the water in motion mm -hmm. in order for it to have enough velocity to do the erosion, which I, I show, and also to keep the sediment in suspension. 
and uh, so you, you uh, and I, I did do some experiments uh, playing with the height of this of this large circular supercontinent, I, I, and it and it didn't appear that the you know adjusting the height, making it completely submerged uh, versus what I ended up with, made very much difference. So as far as the overall uh, pattern of erosion and sedimentation and the total amount of sediment that got deposited. Uh, the, uh, having it above sea level to start with a little bit did, uh, I, I did get uh, a little more erosion, uh, uh, but not, it wasn't that, that much different. Uh, so uh, I, I still think, that, well for me the big, the big uncertainty, a big uncertainty was the mechanism. You know, how, how, do, how in the world do you get drive water strongly enough that it can, that it can carry enough sediment to uh, de deposit it as much as we see in the sediment record in, a, in that short of period of time? I, I took out the slide showing uh, 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 in my talk last summer, I, 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 uh, before I w went into the model, I showed, I get, got some estimates of how much, how much uh, s suspended sediment on average would we need to, to get the record we have during 150 days. And I, I said on average, I found on average you need about 15 meters of sediment suspended at all time to, uh, to, produce, the, uh, to produce the sediment record. Uh, and, uh, but cert certainly it's going to be, it's, you know, episodic. It's not going to be continuous. Uh, but, but the point is that you, you, need a, you need a considerable layer of water with a lot of turbulence to suspend 50 feet, 50 feet of, of sand and silt and clay in the column uh, and, and having that de deposit out. So we're, uh, you know, based on that, I concluded you needed some mechanism like the one I, I was describing today. Yeah, I was. Uh, oh, go ahead. Somebody else. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was uh, 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 curious. Uh, you, you know, we talked about this deposition of uh, you know skeletons get moved with the deposits. What about trace fossils? How did those get deposited? You know, like uh, uh, footprints and dinosaur nests. Uh, I don't. I think those are gone in your model. Well, the uh, not not everywhere, as you saw in some of those plots, there were portions in the interior of the continent that escaped serious erosion. Yeah, uh, but your your model is very initial condition dependent. Yeah. Your Z naught is a scale height, and uh, it, it describes the velocity as a function of depth, um, uh, at, at where it drops to one over e to uh, the you know uh, to one over e the value of the uh, velocity, and uh, so that's 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 arbitrarily chosen, uh, even in that uh, equation. So um, you know it's uh, you know to, well, to I'll, I'll I'll comment on that. It's uh, Actually, in the in the uh, hydraulics literature, that that number is not so arbitrary. Uh, you can there's good ex experiments to to uh, guide in, in a choice for that number. But that but, but that depends on your initial conditions about the depth of the, the uh, water. Not really, not really. So you're it's, talking it's, about the fluid dynamics. It has to do with the the roughness of the surface, yeah. and they okay. show that if you just assume that it's uh, I think it's coarse sand on the bottom. That 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 works in most in most applications. It's it's not that the the, the end result doesn't matter that much on that parameter. Well, it, isn't your model then showing that the results are more difficult for short period of time than long period of time to count for all the sediments? Like I I don't understand why asteroids are rejected as a source because we certainly have. Uh, physical evidence across the solar system of impacts. Right. And if an impact is capable of ejecting enough material to create the moon, then certainly it's right. going to have an asteroid is going to have enough uh, uh, impact to create tides. Right. I, I, uh, I should have commented on that. Uh, 
I excluded large, large asteroids because such, such impacts would almost certainly leave uh, uh, clear evidence of that they were that large. It would leave, leave, leave uh, uh, craters, leave, leave. Uh, well, we uh, see the evidence for craters that are very but large. But not in the flood, not in the flood record. Uh, you don't. You you would find tektites, and you'd you'd find the the the, the evidence for these impacts. And uh, you know the 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 Chicxulub impact. You know there is some evidence for that. But that you know if there were other if there were very many of of those, and that was not that big of a, a, a an object. An object that size is not capable of, of creating a tide, a significant tide. And so I, I, I basically I decided because we see an absence of evidence for larger impacts that uh, they likely did not play a role in the flood and, and were not, you know, so, so it was based on other evidence, other physical evidence, the absence of that physical evidence that I excluded these larger uh, asteroid impacts. So if you limit, but if you limit the size of the asteroid to ones that uh, were, it wouldn't have been obvious. Uh, well, but we see evidence for large impacts sufficient uh, throughout the rest of the solar system. Yes, right. but probably earlier in the history of the solar system than when the flood occurred. Okay, is but my, but is still the but the, your research here is indicating that. A longer time scenario may be more uh, uh, describable than than a short period one, right? I mean, you're you're, you're trying to do this all in 150 days or whatever, and you're showing how difficult it is. Yeah. And it would be less difficult if you uh, if you took a situa situations events, and you you mentioned that there had to be multiple events. Um, over a longer period of time would be more easily able to count for it than a short period of time. Yeah, I was I was trying to be I was trying to be faithful to the biblical text and trying to do it within the within the constraints of of the biblical text as you would normally understand it. So that was the uh, you know those were the rules I was playing by. I was uh, wondering if I were God and wanted to effect what we see happened, I probably would have used the moon to help with the transport of huge amounts of sediments by modifying the, the distance the moon is from the earth. It could have uh, accomplished this maybe much easier. Yeah, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a little nervous about acknowledging that, but my personal, my personal view is that probably w the uh, the body was probably the moon, and I did just briefly mention that in my talk last summer. I didn't make a big deal out of it, but because uh, I don't have a, I, I, I don't have a. I haven't come up with a physics that that really allows that kind of close approach, but uh, uh, my suspicion is that it was the moon, the body responsible. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Baumgartner, for coming today. Um, my question has to do with what would it take to combine your models, this model and your your other previous stuff that you showed us last week about the. Uh, actual continental uh, movements. And if you did so, it would seem to me that uh, you would actually reduce the uh, height or, or the need for as, as much um, tidal forcing in, in the model to combine to, to get the, uh, the amount of sediment transport, et cetera. And it looks like, uh, at least to me, it looks like what you have here is uh, extremely conservative and that you showed, you know, two, three days you had all this uh, erosion, and obviously we had in, in the flood, you know, a, a longer period of time. So it seems like you don't need quite as much of a forcing function to uh, actually get this uh, transport uh, as you need. And then if you um, did combine the two, how would that uh, tidal impulse uh, affect your um, 
triggering or your uh, beginning of that uh, continental uh, drift uh, function and settlement of those uh, cold rings around the margin? Well, uh, yeah, I, there's no, no good reason why I couldn't combine the two models, why I couldn't just uh, take the, the continent locations as a function of uh, time as I get from the first model and use that as an input for the, uh, the uh, time history of the continent in this, in this model I showed today. That would be, you know, that's uh, relatively straightforward to do. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, I just haven't gotten to that point. I haven't had time to do that. Yeah, and then um, also, have you looked at um, how much uh, volume exchange uh, in, your, in your previous model when you were talking about the, the jet uh, motion of the water coming from the ocean and then causing the rain, you know, over 40 days, how that volume of water then passing over the continents running off would be in comparison to this model where you have a, a tidal forcing? Uh, I would say that that effect is going to be relatively small compared to the kinds of uh, water motion that this, that this calculation uh, implies. This, this, that you s that's going on in this scenario. That, that's going to be a very much a second order effect. Okay, and then um, what ha would happen if you used a little bit uh, higher uh, size particles, uh, even as a small percentage in your uh, transport uh, uh, model here? You know, because you used, I think you said three uh, particle sizes, and even the, the largest mean particle size was like only one millimeter or so. And, you know, we do see, you know, areas, and you show those pictures with the huge boulders and stuff. Obviously, that's not a huge percentage of the uh, sediment record, but, the, you know, even half percent or one percent, or like you go out here in the, in the desert, and you can see, you know, I've seen out here where you have some just huge boulders on these fans that are coming down. You go out by La Quinta, you know, and you see these 10, 12-foot diameter boulder fans that have just come down. Well, I... Uh those that coarse sediment, I believe, is is a, a product of of a, a debris flow, probably uh, in mi at least in in some cases, maybe many or most cases, uh, involving gravity, a gravity slide, and so uh, uh, we're getting it. You know, we're talking about relatively localized uh, phenomena, local features, lo local. Uh, processes and uh, it's going to be pretty uh, difficult to fold th those that local scale those local scale phenomena into this kind of global model I think it but you know certainly these kinds of things are, are possible today the the uh, the thing that's uh, that's missing is not computer power or even science, it's, uh, it's uh, manpower. It's, it's somebody motivated to, you know, put, you know, develop the models or run the cases and analyze the results and publish, publish the results. Uh, we, it's an, another case where, you know, the potential harvest is great, but the laborers are few. I'm, 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 I'm hoping, I would, I've heard that there's a new department chair uh, here, and uh, it would be nice. I, I think the potential for Loma Linda to produce some people that could be doing these things is uh, is significant. So uh, uh, I'm, I would like to I'm, I would like to see something happen. Uh, if people think this is important enough, uh, uh, but. Anyway, uh, I, right now it's we, we're I'm I'm just one person. It would be nice to have a, a student or two that I could supervise to uh, s try to see some of these things happen. Okay. Yes, uh, Dr. Baumgartner, your model on the you're saying it's it's probably the the it's, it was probably the moon that uh, would be in your model. 
Yeah, I, I, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I think there's, there's, I'm, I'm, I think that that's the most likely body. So obviously, it had to be passing, or at least be closer. It had for some something had to alter the, mo the temporarily alter the moon's orbit for it to come that close to the right. Earth. Do you do you think that was when the moon kind of arrived here or something? No, or no. no. I believe the moon was here. Okay. Came was formed on creation week to be, you know, yeah. the lesser light. Because so at, at first, uh, when you were explaining it at first, I, I wasn't sure if you were talking about the moon, so maybe it would have been another moon that might have passed or uh, some kind of large meteorite. It could have been some, some, some body from within the solar system that mm -hmm. perhaps got uh, almost captured by the Earth, temporarily uh, captured and made several passes in yeah. a an elliptical orbit, and then somehow <laughs> it got loose again. Usually, they they kind of repeat their orbit generally, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so if if right. some, you know, uh, probably for that to happen, it would would have to have uh, modest speed. Probably that would imply it was a, a body that was from within our solar system, rather than some body that, right. you know, in intergalactic space that happened to be passing through our solar system. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I, have, uh, I, I don't know. And I don't if it know. was going to a trajectory very near the sun, it would probably get caught up in that uh, as well. So uh, anyway, that's all. Any other questions? Uh. Okay. Uh, I know that there is a big deal in the scientific community about when a plate tectonics starts, and even there is uh, evidence of a specific type of rocks that are formed under processes driven by plate tectonics, like eclogites, that they have found in uh, Archean periods. So do you have any comments about this evidence that is completely against to a model of plate tectonics starting in the Mesozoic? Okay, uh, first of all, uh, there's another question where I, I clarified that I have plate tectonics going on at the very beginning of the flood, you know, to, to break, to break uh, uh, Laurentia, Baltica, and Siberia away from a pre-flood continent. So that ha happens, at, you know, at the very beginning of the flood. So there's plate, in my scenario, there's plate tectonics at the very beginning of the flood, and I believe there was plate tectonics uh, uh, during creation week, uh, and uh, but you know, you know when and on on day three it says God said, "Let the waters below the firmament be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear." That that almost certainly impl implies large scale tectonic changes, and uh, it. Hard for me to imagine that not involving plate tectonics. So I believe there was there was significant plate tectonics occurring during Creation Week. Um, I was wondering, uh, one of the other laborers in the field, uh, you may have heard of Art Chadwick. Yes. I wonder if you've seen his work on paleocurrents. Yes, I have. Yeah, I, I, uh, I resolved, I, I had at least a, in good intentions of uh, actually possibly even flying down to uh, DFW and driving over and seeing him and to show him these results and, 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 and seeing if, we, if he was interested in, in uh, running experiments that you know, might shed more light on, 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 uh, on the paleo currents, and see what kind of scenarios, some kind of what kind of start initial conditions I could run, that that might lead, you know, might cor might might give the the paleo current patterns that he is he is seeing. So uh, yes, that would be that's another logical s next step. I have a question. 
I'm not a scientist. I don't pretend to be one. But um, I certainly have taken a lot of observations of what happens uh, akin to the flood. Uh, in Joshua Tree National Park, there's a lot of desert, but there are also mounds that are, that are chimney-like in circular and vertical, in vertical and uh, horizontal um, uh, down there. And they didn't happen just out of a ordinary, they, they, they had to be some kind of residue of what happened in the flood. Yes. I believe, and, yes. and uh, if you look at it, it's, it's, it's extraordinary. It's one of the most extraordinary places I've ever been in. If the Joshua trees are there, it's, it's a gorgeous place, a wonderful place. Everybody that hasn't been there should be there. It's a beautiful place to see and to observe nature and all of its glory, and the birds there are quite different from what we have here. Uh, it's a wonderful sight to see, but I, I would just would want somebody there to explain to me what's going on with those rocks. Because well, they're, they're in general, zone. in general, the uh, the mountains that we have, even just right right around here, uh, I live uh, down in uh, San Diego County, and uh, you know my my property, I'm 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 on a hill hill granite hillside, so to uh, to put in the fruit trees, I actually had to rent an electric jackhammer to dig pits in the granite to plant them, okay? So this, so the issue is, you know, well, this granite that makes up all these mountains around here, and I'm almost sure the ones you're talking about in Joshua Tree National Monument, or, uh, or is it State Park? Uh, National Park. Uh, the, uh, this, this granite, is a result of the subduction of, of the plate that was to the west of North America during the flood, was subducted under the western margin of North and South America. Uh, and, and when it subducted, it carried down sediment, which melted and, uh, and, and, and produced a lot of granitic magma that uh, generated uh, all of the Sierra Nevada, all of the Peninsula Range mountains, including the mountains around here, and at the end of the flood, those that buoyant, uh, that buoyant granitic material rose up, punched up the mountains that we see around us. So the uh, the mountains we have here are are mountains that were uh, formed from magma that was, you know, that was. Uh, most of it probably melted sediments generated during the flood that cooled, crystallized, and then after the flood, uh, because of buoyancy, rose up and produced the mountains. So that's uh, so these these mountains around here are a product of the flood. Thank you very much. That's fascinating. Yeah, my comment is. Uh, I I want to I want to appreciate and affirm your statement that you're being true to the scripture trying to do that as you model this. I think that's very encouraging and we need that kind of modeling. So thank you for that. And uh, just two other comments or questions. Uh in your model am I wasn't here last week. So I I'm picking up that in your thinking is the pre-flood surface of the earth greater than we have it today. Would that be a source um, for the, the, the sediment creation, the deformation with the breaking up of the fountains of the deep. And then secondly, um, if the moon is used, would that be an additional, I'm just thinking out loud that the, the breaking up of the fountains of the deep would be, can we call that a divine intervention? And would the use of the moon be a second divine intervention? Uh, well, I discussed some of these issues last week. Uh, as far as divine intervention, I believe uh, one cannot model what I've been modeling. I, I can't, I can't uh, leave out. I, it, it doesn't work. There are, there are certain special places where I need divine intervention. Yeah. One I mentioned last week was the cooling of the ocean, newly formed ocean floor. The, the laws of physics that we use today simply 
cannot, cannot remove the heat. There's, there's no natural mechanism for getting rid of that heat. And there are other, other, other aspects of what I believe happened during the flood that also requires uh, God's intervention to remove heat. So, uh, uh, so I, I'll be quick to say I, I, I don't believe it's possible to, to understand the flood apart from God's intervention. And I also would say that as far as I could tell, if the moon was involved, it would require his intervention. Uh, Let's see, now I've already forgotten the other point uh, about last week. Oh, the idea of the pre-continent. Oh, oh, yeah, the continent before the flood. Yeah. I, the, uh, basically, the continents represent a roughly 40-kilometer thick layer of granitic rock. Uh, the granite is a special rock. As far as we know, it doesn't exist on any other body in the solar system. It appears to be unique to the Earth. And on Earth, there's a considerable volume of it, making up all the continents of this 40-kilometer thick layer over something like 40% of the Earth. And uh, uh, I believe that that was, it was, was something that was part of God's original creation of the Earth, creating this granite layer. And uh, I believe it's, it, it, for the most part, it's, most of it is still around. And, it, and it, it, it goes back to creation, and a lot of a lot of a lot of creationists are nervous about that. But I'm I, I can't I can't uh, imagine it any other way. I'm not saying I can't. I'm, you know I'm, I may not. You know I may be wrong, but I I feel pretty confident that uh, that the granite the granite except for the like the the, the granite I just mentioned a result of melting of sediment during the flood, most of the granite that makes up most of the continent was, dates back to creation week. And therefore, I do not believe the, the continents were more, that much different, that much more extensive before the flood than they are today. Yeah, I, uh, another question. Um, the, uh, your initial conditions for, for your uh, continental drift um, What's, what initiated a subduction in the first place? All right. I, I, I don't yeah. remember hearing I, that. I don't know if I, I think I touched on that last week, but um, I don't have, a, I don't have a, a, a confident answer to that. I did uh, uh, co-author a paper that was presented, I think, in, I think it was 2003. Uh, where we looked at the possibility that uh, at the at the end of creation week, that there was uh, there was there was uh, cold. It, it, well, it at the end of creation week there was an in, initial condition that uh, it wouldn't have taken very much on God's part for Him to have used that to trigger the flood. In other words, a ring of coal material in the upper mantle surrounding the supercontinent could well have been a, a product of the formation of that continent during creation week and was there available to, to drive the runaway uh, that, uh, that drove the, the, you know, was involved with the tectonic uh, changes during the flood. In any case, God had to initiate it with some causal input. Then, it, of it, its own. But it, we, what we said is that it, it, it could have been moving in that direction very slowly, uh, getting closer and closer to that critical point, which it was reached right, you know, as Noah finished the ark. And, and that, that it may not have re required any significant trigger. So uh, you, you talked about the heat that had to be removed during the, the, the separation or the drift phase during the flood. Was that in your model? Was that continually removed, or was it moved at, uh, at the end, removed at the end, or did you need the heat in order to drive the process? No, I I removed it. I basically uh, I, I I I I had to alter the thermal conductivity of rock. Okay. So and that and that basically the thermal conductivity allowed the heat to to uh, uh, to escape. Okay. But that, that was, that was uh, you know, I, I, it was, a, you know, it, it was basically another way of, of uh, 
So, Sim simulating God's hand in the process. Okay, so I, I've worked with a lot of Fortran code, big ones like radio transfer models and eclipsing binary models, and but I've never seen a God did it subroutine. Yeah. So what does that look like? All right, all I did was uh, I changed the input parameter on the thermal conductivity. <laughs> okay, a little uh, comment about the moon again. If, 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 if it was the moon that moved, of course we don't have any actual scientific reason the moon would move closer and then move back, right? So, so that would be maybe a, a divine you know, situation there. But um, also if it was closer, obviously it would be much larger and probably if Noah saw it, which would be likely he would see it, I would think, unless it was on the other side of the planet and moved away quickly enough or something, uh, it would be probably he'd comment about that large moon, I would think. That's one thing. And then uh, the other thing is, um, could Noah's, it seems unlikely that Noah's, uh, the Noah, the ark, could survive such waves. I, I don't know what your comment on that would be. Well, I have a friend, he, he's uh, 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 has an uh, endowed chair position in a mechanical engineering department, and he, he's a believer, he, he's modeled the flood with more realism than anybody that I know of, and uh, demonstrated the incredible stability of the arc for uh, uh, dealing with wave activity and uh, uh, plus if you add ballast in it and lower its center of gravity uh, it, it becomes extremely stable and uh, so uh, uh, and, and all, I, I would say that the crucial thing is for that arc to get to deep water to, you know not be on the continent be, be out in deep water and then these waves you know, there's still significant amplitude, but nothing, nothing like the kinds of uh, situations that I was showing in the, in the calculation on the continent. Again, since the arc was designed with no real mobility, internal mobility, it would basically be floating. Uh, do you have any information that would uh, cause that to be more in the calmer waters, perhaps? All I know is that the, you know, the ark was preserved. I, in, in, uh, I think it's Genesis 8.1, there's a cryptic phrase, uh, uh, but God remembered Noah. And so I believe there, there may be a lot packed into those words. We happened to fall upon a, uh, a very <laughs> old video with you in it, with the, you know, the relationship with the ark. I don't know if uh, you have to think way back there, <laughs> maybe, uh, but it, uh, it said bomb gardener and it pictured you in the uh, uh, in reference to the to the place in Mount Ararat or yeah well that there. that I, I was uh, <laughs> a little naive and was at, at that point and I, 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 know, I regretted being involved in that but I might mention that I'm involved in another uh, attempt to find the ark currently but they did mention some interesting things there about the stones, the very large stones with the holes in them. Now, I, I'm assuming then the ark had to carry those stones. Well, or you know, that was a theory that those were that those yeah. were anchor stones for the ark. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're made out of local basalt. Mount Ararat's, uh, you know, erupted a lot of basaltic lava, so. It's it's uh, it's easy to get, find that lava. It's it's so it, I I don't believe those stones had anything to do with the ark. They they may commemorate the ark somehow, but they're they're not. They weren't on the ark. They're made out of the local basaltic rock. I, I thought that was very interesting about the when they did the metal testing and you were talking about the uh, at the time, <laughs> the uh, I mean it almost looks like rock, but it was metal and that it would. It was it was it was uh, it was rock ha had a lot of iron in it. That's why it responded to the metal detector. But it okay. was volcan. It was it was at that time I didn't realize that there was a sliver of uh, what's called ophiolite, old ocean floor that runs right underneath that site. Uh, when I took samples of that rock back to Los Alamos and had it analyzed and 
had the geologists there look at them, they were scratching their heads. They, it, we were all scratching our heads. It wasn't until I started working with a Turkish geologist that he gave me that critical piece of information that that's ophiolite and that those rocks are heavily weathered basalt from the ocean floor. And uh, we, I just didn't expect there in inland there in Turkey to find ophiolite, but that's, that's, at the, that's along the suture zone where the Arabian plate slammed up against Asia. And in that suture zone, there's a little bit of ocean floor that got incorporated into the surface continental rocks. And uh, so uh, those, those, and, that, and that rock did have quite a bit of iron in it, and, and it, did, yeah. it did give a response from the metal detectors. Yeah, it, it, did, it did pretty much look like rock, but you could see the iron in it. So but it, it looked like there was a marbling to me, but I think I've seen rocks. Okay, thank you. So according to the standard, uh, standard geology, the granitic mountains takes a lot, a lot of time to cool down, millions of years. So if according to your view, mm, the mountains that are around us now, they are, they are already cooled down, how could this occur in so thousands of years, not millions of years? Yeah, like the standard, standard yeah. geology says. Now, which mountains did you mention? The granitic mountains that are here. Around here? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, it, in general, uh, it doesn't, it, the, the hydrothermal, hydrothermal circulation, hydrothermal processes can cool uh, a modest thickness of granite rather quickly within, within weeks you can cool granite down. Uh, and uh, so, uh, uh, it, you know, it, I, as I was, uh, in answer to another question, I, I do believe that in order to cool the, uh, eight, you know, 60, 70, 80, 100 kilometer thick ocean lithosphere that had to be, you know, in, in the catastrophic plate tectonic scenario had to have been generated at a mid-ocean ridge during the flood. In order to get rid of all that heat in that thick layer, uh, I, don't, I don't think that, well, thermal conductivity cannot do it. Even, even some hydrothermal circulation when the rock is, is near the ridge is, will only cool the uppermost part of it. Uh, I, believe, uh, I, I believe it had to involve God's intervention to cool that rock down. And, uh, a topic I haven't discussed here is uh, I was part of a team called Radioisotopes in the Age of the Earth. And uh, we, we found evidence, radioisotope evidence, that there was uh, a large amount of nuclear decay that occurred during the flood. And again, to alter nuclear decay rates requires the hand of God, as far as I know. There's no natural exp way to, to alter the nuclear decay rates by orders of magnitude, naturally. And the other side of that coin, there's so much heat released by, when you change, when you increase the nuclear decay rate, you've got to remove that heat. So that's another thing that requires God's intervention. So I, I, I believe that, you know, there was, God did something during the flood to remove a lot of heat. And so, uh, Possibly the cooling of these of these mountains around here, uh, part of that cooling uh, did in what was involved with this other other cooling that seems to be required. I, I you know I, I I try not as a scientist I try not uh, only at the at the last resort when I when I hit a, a stone wall and say physical law just cannot do that cannot explain it. I'm, I, 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 I don't immediately, if I encounter a, a problem, say, well, God must have done it. But when I've spent years working on it and conclude there's no, I have no, no, there doesn't seem to be any possibility for explaining it with a natural mechanism, I say, well, this, this, uh, this probably uh, involved God's, God's intervention. So have you done some research about hydrothermal cooling? 
sorry. Have you done some research about hydrothermal cooling? Hydrothermal cooling? Yeah. Um, I've, I mean, I'm, I'm generally aware of it from a theoretical standpoint, uh, but I've, uh, I've not actually written an, a numerical code that does it. That's what you're asking. Yeah. No. One more question. Um, it seems to me that uh, the one, one area that uh, might require a, another direct intervention would be the, uh, after your process is over and you've laid down all the, all the sediment, and that is the, the change from just straight to laid down sediment over to actual rock, the, the consolidation process. And I asked you a little bit about this the last time, you know, and cementation and the rest of that, because you know, in large areas of the earth, we have, you know, sedimentary rock formations, but then there's other areas where we have, you know, basins and stuff that are still younger, you know, alluvial and filled in sediments that are fairly deep, especially like out here in, you know, Coachella Valley, some of that sediment's real, real deep without actually being turned into a, a rock. So if, you know, you would think that if it was all, a, really rapid process, then it would affect both air types of areas the same. Otherwise, you know, it seems to me like that's one area where some direct intervention must yeah, be required. I, I, I don't, I'm not going to claim to have a good answer to that. I, I would say that we, we do see evidence of rapid dewatering of the sediments. We see uh, it's in, in many places the uh, escape, water escape pipes of the water coming out of out of, uh, out of the sediments. And uh, it also appears that there are, uh, have, you know, the, what's, well, various, what's called diagenic processes of, of cementing rock, of ha having minerals in the water that, that cause, uh, cause the, the cementation of the rock to happen, that, that, that it appears that that can happen quickly. Uh, and so just whether, whether uh, natural processes can account for such rapid cementation of, of most of the rock, sedimentary rock we have in the world. Uh, that's not my area of expertise, and I, I don't know if anybody really knows the answer to that. Uh, I th my impression is that there are situations where cementation can occur rapidly, you know, within days. Uh, <laughs> But whether that those processes uh, operated on a, on you know large scales almost everywhere, I I don't I can't say. Well, if you did have that rapid cementation, you would have an addition to your heat problem because that uh, obviously the hydration process creates heat as well. <laughs> so there's one more area where you got a large amount of heat in the volume you got to get rid of. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, I'll I just just might comment on the, the cementation story. Uh, Shin uh, in Florida did a uh, an experiment where he took some carbonate material, put it under high pressure, very high pressure, uh, for three weeks, and it changed into rock. Uh, the pressures he used were equivalent to maybe seven, eight thousand feet, which is possibly average for the uh, Colorado Plateau. Uh, but uh, under pressure, pressure is an important factor in yeah. cementation. Uh, this can occur uh, much more rapidly than uh, surmised. Uh, uh, people sometimes say, well, look, the Grand Canyon, it, it, it was all soft. You, you couldn't have cut that at, I know you're in a different model, but uh, Ord's model is, uh, it was happened as a post-flood uh, or I shouldn't say not post-flood, a, uh, a flood escape of the waters, the decrease of the water cut the Grand Canyon then. Yeah, I uh, tend to think it was probably after the flood yeah, itself. Yeah, I, I understand uh, you're in a different model there. But, uh, but the model is criticized because, well, you know, the, the Canyon should have slumped in and so on. Under the pressure of those layers, 
and uh, at the top of the Grand Canyon, you're only on the top of the Permian, and you've got your whole Mesozoic and Cenozoic on top of that, which there's some evidence that it was there. Yeah. Uh, it could have gotten hard very fast. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Professor Roth has dealt with this a lot more than I have, so uh, and he's aware of the literature better than I am. So I, I would uh, suggest if you really want more a better answer, talk directly to him. No? OK. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, I may ask a question. Um, my understanding is that the peat sandstone is first, and then there's a shale above it. Um, I've forgotten which shale it is. Bright Angel. Bright Angel shale, and then the mauve limestone on yes. top of that. Yes. And that seems to be a kind of a pattern if you go up that you see sandstone, shale, limestone, and then it repeats, and sometimes with some conglomerate uh, at the bottom of that. Does this fit into the kinds of cycles that you were talking about? Yes. Yeah. In a, gen in a general way. In a general way, yeah. First, uh, Dr. Moongardner, I want to thank you for being here. And I appreciate what was your last slide, the necessity of Bible-believing Christians to to come to a believable model of what happened if we're going to preserve the flood as a, an event in Earth history. Uh, I'd like to give you a little consolation that you are not altogether alone in invoking extraterrestrial interventions. Uh, I have been to two conferences of what is today called the, the Thunderbolt Project. Uh, in Albuquerque, for example, where there were something like 300 scientists gathered, and uh, they, they were proposing totally different versions of solar system history from the, the mainstream astronomical version. Uh, these were not speaking from a religion perspective whatsoever. These were astronomers, professors of physics, and serious scientists. And some of them were whispering the name of Velikovsky and his invocation of, uh, of an abnormal uh, interplanetary body of some kind that came to impact the Earth, or affect it rather drastically. So uh, uh, it does seem very speculative. But uh, I think most of us here today want very much to find a story which helps the, the, the flood of Noah to make sense. And I thank you very much for being here and helping to maybe put together for us some of the ingredients in that story. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I Thank you very much. I appreciate the, all the interest and attention, staying uh, well over an hour for questions. That's uh, <laughs> amazing. So thank you.